Welcome to Keep What You Earn, your judgment and jargon-free zone for entrepreneurs of all levels. Get ready to learn how to scale your business, save money in taxes, and create a business that grows your wealth. If it feels like the financial side of business is like eating your vegetables, well then think of this podcast as the ranch dressing to make the process a little more enjoyable. My name is Shannon Weinstein. I'm a CPA and business owner on a mission to simplify money and empower others through knowledge. I hope this episode inspires you to take action, but remember that the information we share is for educational purposes only and is not individual tax advice. Now that we got that out of the way, let's start the show. Okay, so by now you've heard me, other bookkeepers, finance creators, business advisors, and basically anyone under the sun advising you not to commingle your business and personal stuff. And it can feel like one of those things where, well, I don't really understand why I'm not supposed to, but I was told, you know, I'll get a slap on the wrist or whatever if I do this. And, you know, I get it that the business sometimes has more money in the bank account than the personal. It can be hard to know the cues of creating a rhythm on like when to pay yourself and when to move that money. And it's just easier if you use your business credit card because, hey, that's where the money is. I get it. Trust me. But I actually want to explain the reason why we don't want you to commingle your stuff. There's multiple reasons. And they're not just because it's easier for your accountant. Now, that is a side effect bonus. (laughs) Don't get me wrong that it's a lot easier for us to keep track of everything if your stuff isn't commingled. If everything's in the proper folder, you know, I remember when we were kids and you had like these big binders or like I had a trapper keeper and I had these folders. So like one was math, one was science, you know, one was social studies. As long as you put all your assignments that belonged into each of those things in their proper folder, everything was easy to find. So if you're using one massive folder and putting everything in it, it's a lot harder to find what you need. And most of the time, your accountant is the one digging and searching in the early stages of your business. So keeping things organized is just one element of it. Now, that's not enough of a compelling argument for most people to create a new habit, that it's just going to be easier for somebody they pay to go and clean it up. So I'm going to explain to you the, the significant benefits of keeping your stuff separated, the stuff that actually affects you, because it's one thing for the accountants to say, please don't commingle your stuff. They never really explain why or the impact that it can have. So if you have done this before, if you have mixed up your business and personal, you may have felt the sting of having to keep things organized and having to unwind all of that at tax time to figure out the tax reporting. So number one, the most obvious reason is to make tax reporting easier for you and your pro. Because when you have everything separated, it's really easy to understand what was business income, what wasn't, what was business expenses, and what wasn't. Also, number two, if you do get audited, and this is key, if you do get audited, and frankly, you have very little control over whether or not you get audited. There are behaviors that you can have that will help you minimize the risk, but you can never fully prevent yourself from getting audited, much like you can't prevent yourself from getting pulled over. Now, you can not speed, you can behave as a really good driver, but there's always a possibility that some factor out of your control will lead to you getting pulled over or stopped or you'll hit a checkpoint or whatever that you will be inquired somewhere along the way. So it's better to be ready for those situations in case they happen because you can't always prevent them from happening. So if you do get audited, here's the thing. If you separate your business and personal, this is going to be key because the auditor, one of the first things they do, the first thing on the checklist for the auditor is to examine deposits. So when they take you through an audit, you're going to go through a bank deposit analysis. And what that means is that they're going to pull your bank statements for your business bank account and look for all of the deposits to make sure you're claiming that as income or you can say that was a contribution or a loan or another type of source of cash. Okay, so they're going to try to identify the sources of all the cash that came in and match it up against what you're claiming in income just to make sure that you're being honest. It's the first thing they do to establish trust with you. So here's the thing. If you have, number one, if you have uh, transactions that are in the personal account or personal transactions that are in the business account, then this means that they're going to have to pull 
bank statements for your business and yourself personally. This could also mean joint accounts with you and your spouse. So they went from coming into your house and examining one room to ransacking the whole place looking for what they're looking for. It's unnecessary for them to have to pull all that stuff. If they're auditing your business, they should be able to just pull your bank statements from your business. But if you have stuff commingled, if you have business stuff scattered in multiple rooms of the house instead of the one room that it was supposed to be for, now they're going to go through the whole house, you know? So it would, and it's not like they're going to find anything bad necessarily. I don't want you to think that we're trying to avoid something or hide something here, but wouldn't it be nice if they spent one hour searching through one room of your house instead of a whole afternoon going through all these different rooms and asking questions? You got stuff to do. You don't want to be dealing with that. It's an inconvenience to the nth degree. So we want to minimize the inconvenience of this audit by shrinking the amount of area they have to look at to find all the business transactions. So that is one key benefit of keeping everything separated. And then lastly, there is a, I think the most impactful factor. And that is if you have an LLC, now disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer and I don't claim to be, but I do know that there is a risk here, especially in certain states where if you're commingling, if you're commingling your business and personal funds, then this is called piercing the corporate veil. And part of the benefit of getting an LLC, which you've probably heard of, is this idea of liability protection, where if, for example, your business gets sued, they can't come after your personal assets, and vice versa. That is fundamentally how pe most people understand an LLC to operate. However, imagine this. You end up in court over something like that. Someone sues you in your business and you have real estate and funds and accounts all over the place personally. And they say well, they want to go after you personally because maybe there isn't enough in the bank account to cover the damages. So they want to go after you personally. Well, can they? Well, I'm not saying this would happen to you. I can't possibly speculate, you know, all the circumstances around a lawsuit or anything like that, but there's a possibility that if you're not if you're mixing your business and personal funds, the concept is if you won't respect the boundaries of your business, why would you expect us to? Right? Why would you expect us to respect that? And I want you to remember that that you set the standard of what you want. So if you don't set boundaries, people won't respect them. So you can put the boundaries up all you want. You can put the fences up, but if you leave the gate open, it won't matter <laughs> if you put the fence up. See what I mean? That you can invest all that in setting up the LLC for liability protection, but then at the end of the day, when you're using it as a personal piggy bank, well, then you kind of it kind of defeats the purpose. And I'm not saying this will happen 100% of the time, but I am saying that this is something to be on the lookout for because you could essentially invalidate the very value of your LLC by behaving this way. So it's more than just a like favor to your accountant. It's more than something that is just a good habit and is just a, you know, I call it the business vegetables. It's more than just something healthy you should be doing. It's more than the business vitamin. It's something that could actually have a serious impact on you if not done. And most people don't acknowledge the possible outcomes here if you do that. So I'm just telling you, if you are currently commingling your stuff, the best thing to do is keep the stuff separated. You have a separate business bank account, a separate business credit card, and you exclusively use them for their own purposes. And if you must use you know, a business account for personal expenses or vice versa, just make sure that you're properly reimbursing things or you're properly accounting for those things in the rare instances that they happen. I wouldn't make it a habit. I understand things happen. We want to be as close as possible to 100% accurate and 100% isolated business and personal transactions. But I understand that stuff comes up and I understand that it's possible to push a few things through. And as long as it's accounted for properly, you're good. So don't worry. No one's going to jail if they commingle their business expenses and their personal expenses, but just understand that this is one of the best ways that you could prevent with a small behavior, a huge inconvenience down the road and a huge issue by forming a very small habit now. 
I want to tell you about an entrepreneur that I know who was struggling to cross beyond 300,000 in revenue. And it felt like she was always hitting this ceiling and couldn't break free from it. She knew she had to make more, but also had to hire more people. And she was way too scared to hire and spend all her money investing in that team. Almost everybody struggles with these types of decisions, but not everybody has access to a fractional CFO to create the plan and the projections that show the path to your next stage of business. I understand that a fractional CFO can be an intimidating investment for some, which is why we offer one-on-one intensives called power sessions. These sessions are two mornings in a row with me focused on just you and your business and getting you the tailored advice that you need to reach a goal. Whether it's creating your goals and projections for the year, forecasting your cash flow, or developing a compensation plan for your team, a CFO Power Session can help you get clarity on those burning questions holding you back from making the decisions that you need to make. Spots are limited as I typically take on only two per month. So click the link in the show notes now to schedule a free call with me and learn more. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, please leave a rating and review on your podcast platform. This small action goes a long way for podcasters to get our message heard by more business owners just like you. Be sure to check out the show notes for links to information about our guests and ways to get in touch with me. We'll see you on the next episode.